So uh, we come to our topic of heart failure. Uh, for the definition of heart failure, American uh, heart academic defines the heart failure as a uh, complex clinical syndrome that results from the structural or functional impairment of the ventricular filling or ejection of blood, which in turn leads to the cardinal symptoms of dyspnea and fatigue and signs of heart failure, edema and rates. So these uh, four words and these two words are important. So this is the AHA definition of heart failure. Now we come to the etiology of the heart failure. In the etiology of heart failure, there is first is the heart failure with a reduced EF, uh, in which the EF is less than 40%. Now, first etiology is the coronary artery disease, myocardial ischemia, infarction. This is the first cause. Then, second is the chronic volume overload. This is recurrent valvular disease, intracardiac left to right shunting. Third is the chronic pressure overload, hypertension, and obstructive valvular disease. Fourth is the chronic lung disease, core pulmonary and pulmonary vascular disease. Non ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy, and 6 is the Dagas disease, and 7 is the chronic bradyarrhythmias. and tachyarrhythmias. Now uh, we come to the next uh, part that is the heart failure with preserved EF, in which uh, the etiology is uh, first is the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, second is the hypertension. Hypertension can cause both with the reduced EF also and with the preserved EF also. Third is the aging and fourth is the restrictive cardiomyopathy that is aminodosis, uh, sarcoidosis, hemochromatosis. These two are the infiltrative disorders and this is the storage disorder in which iron deposition takes place. Now fifth is the fibrosis and sixth is the endomyocardial disorders. So, uh, now, uh, one more point is the high output states, the thyrotoxicosis, systemic arteriovenous shunting and chronic anemia and beriberi. These are the states in which heart is normal but uh, there is high output state in the body, so heart has to work more. So that may also cause the failure. Now we come to the NYHA classification, New York Heart Association classification. Now, in which the symptoms are fatigue, palpitation, dyspnea, and anxiety pain. Whenever a patient is having just uh, these symptoms, uh, the classification is based on uh, this uh, NYHA. Now, NYHA first uh, class is the patient is with the cardiac disease. But ordinary physical activity, this word is important, ordinary physical activity varies from person to person. For a particular person, ordinary physical activity doesn't cause any symptom in class first. Now, second is class second, the ordinary physical activity is So, in the NYHA class second, the ordinary physical activity results in symptom. Symptom means it results either in fatigueness or palpitation, dyspnea or anxiety pain. Class third is less than ordinary physical activity results in symptom. And class fourth is patient is symptomatic at rest. Uh, Next, we will discuss the pathophysiology of the heart failure and the diagnosis and the clinical features in it. Now we come to the pathophysiology of the heart failure. In the pathophysiology, I have uh, shown it with the help of diagram and I have explained each and everything written in the diagram. Mm. And this is just to make the things very simple. Now in the pathophysiology, first there is some index event that occur. Index event can be anything. Most commonly it is myocardial infarction because we know CAD is the most common cause of the heart failure. So suppose it is myocardial infarction, there is some index event that occur that causes the initial decline in the pumping activity of the heart. So that causes the compensatory mechanism activation. And this is to bring the cardiac output to the normal. This is to bring cardiac output to the normal to meet the demand of the body. But uh, when this compensation, uh, compensatory mechanism activation is uh, there for a prolonged period of time, then uh, this leads to certain uh, changes in the body and the heart. 
and that is uh, the pathophysiology behind the uh, sign and symptoms of the heart failure. Now, uh, what's the compensatory mechanism that are activated? First, there is adenergic nervous system activation. There is increased sympathetic uh, activation in the body. Second, there is renin angiotensin aldosterone system activation. Uh, third, there is cytokine system activation. Cytokine means the inflammatory markers, that is TNF alpha. These are the increase in the uh, heart failure that itself causes the inflammatory injury to the uh, vessels to the uh, body. So the cytokine system is also get activated. Now, at last, when the cardiac output that get reduced, there is unloading of the baroreceptor in the left ventricle, carotid sinus, and the aortic arch. Uh, unloading of baroreceptor in left ventricle, carotid sinus, and aortic arch. And this uh, unloading uh, increases the sympathetic tone and increase uh, the ADH secretion from the pituitary. Now this ADH causes the increased retention of the water uh, from the kidney collecting tip drugs. Okay, it causes the increased retention of water that causes the edema and that itself increases the cardiac output also because of the increased retention of the uh, water. Now at, uh, and there is increase in the sympathetic tone also. In the sympathetic tone, uh, if it is increased, then it will uh, give uh, positive stimulation to the RAS activation and to the adenergic nervous system activation. So, in the renin angiotensin aldosterone system activation, uh, altogether there is increased salt and water retention due to the action of aldosterone. Increased salt and water retention is there, and that uh, for a long time it's there that causes the vasoconstriction of the periphery uh, vasculature. We know angiotensin is a very strong uh, vasoconstrictor, so it causes the vasoconstriction of periphery, and there is uh, myocyte hypertrophy also, myocyte cell death also, and myocardial fibrosis also. So this is you are seeing that the uh, the pathophysiology, uh, the clinical feature is because of all these things that myocyte cell that fibrosis occurring, and it is all due to the RAS. So its antagonism is very important in the uh, treatment of heart failure. So this is the neurohormonal activation. So uh, in the management we will uh, see that the, the most important part of the uh, management is the neurohormonal antagonism that is the RAS antagonism that is the chronic heart failure that we will see later when we will deal with the management. Now uh, sustained neurohormonal stress this leads to the transcriptional and the post transcriptional changes in the genes that regulates the excitation contraction coupling and changes in the cross bridge. So this is a uh, sustained neurohormonal uh, stress that causes some transcription and the post-transcriptional changes. So in the excitation contraction coupling, what is the change that we are having? It is the decreased function of the SARCA2A. What is SARCA2A? This is the sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium adenosine trifoxate. Its decreased function causes a decreased calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum that causes a decreased pumping activity because calcium is needed for the pumping activity, for the contraction. And other is the hyperfoxorylation of the ranodine receptor that causes the leakage of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And this change in the cross bridge is that there is decreased expression of the alpha myosin heavy chain and there is increased expression of the beta myosin heavy chain. Both causes the systolic dysfunction because of the less ability to contract, it causes the systolic dysfunction. Now, in ischemia that occurs in the case of heart failure, uh, there is decreased ATP. And we know relaxation is also depending upon the ATP because it's an active process. So there is impaired relaxation because of a decreased ATP that causes the diastolic dysfunction. 
other is that the interstitial fibrosis and deposition of collagen in the myocardium due to sustained uh, neurohormonal activation this causes the increase in diastolic pressure and this leads to the diastolic dysfunction so this was all about uh, pathophysiology and nearly i have covered each and every point uh, given the harrison regarding the pathophysiology now in the next part we will discuss the signs and symptoms and diagnosis so uh, we come to the uh, next part that is the clinical feature and the uh, signs and symptoms in the heart failure before going into i must like to uh, explain what term there is a left ventricular remodeling that also a part of the pathophysiology due to the neurohormonal activation and different stress uh the myocyte hypertrophy fibrosis and uh, that take place that we have explained previously in the pathophysiology due to this left ventricular remodeling takes place what is the definition of it it is a change in the lv mass volume and shape and composition of the heart that occur after cardiac injury or any abnormal hemodynamic loading condition just you have to know lv mass volume and shape change due to neurohormonal activation Uh, leading to myocardial hypertrophy, fibrosis, and death. Now, symptoms uh, of the heart failure. Symptom we know two cardinal symptoms of heart failure is the fatigue and shortness of breath. Why there is shortness of breath? There is pulmonary congestion, the deformation of interstitial, or the intra-alveolar fluid. Why? Because of the decreased pumping activity, heart is not able to manage uh, the blood uh, coming from the pulmonary. Base and actually it is the back pressure that is because of the decreased pumping activity. It creates a back pressure and that goes towards the pulmonary circulation also and causes the pulmonary congestion and that activates the just a capillary J receptor that causes the dyspnea that causes the rapid and the shallow breathing. Now dyspnea this is important dyspnea become less frequent with the onset of right ventricular failure and tricuspid regurgitation in patient of heart failure. Uh, dyspnea will become less frequent with the onset of RVF and TR. Now two terms that is orthopnea and the PND. PND is paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Uh, this is a severe shortness of breath that occur one to three hour after retiring to bed. Following this, patient has to adopt and uh, sitting position and uh, with the hanging of the leg by the side of the bed and with the tendency to rush to the window for the fresh air. and this is related to the cardiac asthma and a wheezing also uh, there can be wheezing that is that is due to the bronchospasm so it's important uh, to differentiate cardiac asthma from the primary bronchial asthma now other is orthopnea orthopnea is a dyspnea in the supine position dyspnea in supine position uh, and both has the the cause behind it same uh, it's it is same in both it is that while lying so fine there is increase in the blood flow uh, increase in the blood flow towards the heart because of the uh, from the lower extremities so that causes the increase uh, blood flow towards the heart leading to the to the leading to the dyspnea so uh, this is orthopnea dyspnea in the supine position now and more thing is the kinetic stroke respiration it, it is in the 40% of the patient in advanced heart failure uh, they, it is alternating uh, apneic and the hyperventilating phase and it is usually associated with the low cardiac output caused by increased sensitivity of respiratory center to the arterial pco okay when there is apnea or there is increased co2 and that causes the hyperventilation and then there is a hyperventilating phase and then again there is apneic so this is alternating apneic and the hyperventilatory phase now other symptoms in the heart are heart failure are the anorexia nausea because heart is an heart failure is a uh, as, as we have explained in the pathophysiology heart failure is an uh, also causes the cytokine activation that's an inflammatory state in inflammatory stage leading to the uh, decrease uh, absorption of uh, the proteins or uh, decrease uh, absorption of the nutrients and that uh, initially causes the weight loss that is a separate term known as a cardiac cachexia now uh, the other symptoms in the heart failure is anorexia nausea and early satiety 
uh, associated with abdominal pain and fullness. That can be due to the edema of the bowel bone and the hepatic congestion in the heart failure. Now there is right upper quadrant pain because of the hepatic congestion. Cerebral symptoms like the confusion, disorientation, sleep and mood disturbances can be there. Nocturia is also an important sign in the heart failure. Now these are the uh, symptoms. Now we will come to the sign. What we have in the physical examination. In the physical examination, first journal, the systolic blood pressure is usually low in the advanced heart failure. In the early it can be normal, it can be high, but in the advanced it is uh, low. There can be sinus tachycardia because of the increased adrenergic drive, X we have explained in the pathophysiology. Uh, there can be sinus tachycardia. There is peripheral vasoconstriction. And that, uh, that we have explained pathophysiology also and leading to the cool and uh, cool peripheral extremities and sinuses of the lips and the nail beds. And GVP may be raised and uh, there is positive abdominal jugular reflex. Okay. And there is GI and B wave in the tricuspid regurgitation. You can have the GI and B wave in the GVP. Uh, uh, in the respiratory system, you will get the pulmonary crackles. Are rails that are mostly in the basis or base of both the sides, and uh, at the lung basis, you will have the uh, crabs. Now, fear of fusion is also a common finding, uh, leading to a decreased breath sound or the absent breath sound. It is usually bilateral, but if it is unilateral, it is most commonly right sided. Now, uh, see uh, now the cardiac, now cardiac respiration, uh, cardiac examination. Now, first in the cardiac examination, there is displaced apex width that is down and out. There is LB type of apex and uh, apex width normal position at fifth intercostal space and it is uh, uh, displaced down and out. Okay, uh, fifth intercostal space 2.5 centimeter uh, medial to the mid clavicular line. Now, S3 sound is present in patient with the volume overload. Okay. Uh, and S4 is not a specific indicator of heart failure. This is an important time because someone can ask you uh, what is the S3 and S4 in the heart failure. Now S3 indicates the volume overload. S4 is not a specific indicator. Murmurs of uh, mitral regurgitation and tricuspid regurgitation is frequently heard in advanced heart failure. Okay. So now at last we come to the abdominal examination heart failure. There can be tender hepatomegaly, there can be ictrus. Also ictrus is a late finding in the abdominal examination. Now uh, peripheral edema in the ankle and the pre-tibial region uh, is strong. And uh, uh, in the bedridden person uh, patients, pre-central edema is common. So this was all about the physical finding. Next, uh, we so we come to the diagnosis of the heart failure. Also the diagnosis of the heart failure is very pretty clear if you know that the patient is a known case of cardiac uh, disease and it present with the classical sign symptom of heart failure. But if uh, as we know that the clinical feature of heart failure are very non-specific. So in a new person in which uh, we are not aware of any cardiac status of the patient, we must go for some additional laboratory investigation also to rule out certain other diseases. And also in the patient that we know also that he is having some cardiac illness, we must go for the other investigation to rule out the other causes of the similar signing symptoms. So routine lab test is the CBC. Yeah, and uh, first and then CBC uh, for what you have to see the HB level because that also can cause the symptom. In the KFT you have to look for the kidney level uh, because kidney dysfunction can also cause this type of uh, functions or this type of clinical features. And LFT you have to look for the congestion. You have to look for the congestion, uh, hepatic congestion uh, that can be there uh, secondary to the heart failure. Uh, it can be there that there is primary disease of the liver that causing the uh, workload on the heart and causing the feature of the hepatic failure, oh, sorry, heart failure rather. Uh, now uh, we have to go for the panel of the electrolytes uh, to look uh, for any metabolic encephalopathy or any, any type of uh, decreased sodium or whatsoever leading to the retention of the fluid. Uh, 
Now, other you have to look for the urinal lysis to look uh, for the any abnormal protein uh, protein urea uh, that can also cause uh, the similar sign and symptoms like pedalidema. Uh, fasting blood glucose to rule out uh, diabetes. This is very important. Lipid profile to look for the status of the lipid in the uh, body. Uh, as we know that the coronary artery disease is the most common cause of the heart failure. So we must look for the lipid profile also. Now, second comes the ECG. Uh, ECG is to see for any left ventricular hypertrophy. QRS duration in the ECG uh, because we know that the QRS duration is also associated with some uh, prognosis because if it is more than 149 millisecond and patient is highly symptomatic, uh, he is N, N by HA class, third or fourth, then he, he has to be uh, given the ICD. So uh, this is important in it, ICD and uh, other CRD uh, and uh, the nor and what is important is normal ECG virtually exclude any LV systolic dysfunction. If ECG is normal then you are pretty sure that person is having a normal systolic, LV systolic function, his EF is nearly normal. Now the chest x-ray is done to look for the cardiac size you can say and the shape and to look for any pulmonary edema and to rule out any pulmonary infections okay uh, and the last is the and d is the assessment of the lv function in the two dimensional echocardiography you can uh, see for the lv size function cardiac valve status or any regional wall motion abnormality present uh, to see for the lv mass and volume MRI is the gold standard. Okay. Now, last, this is the biomarkers. Biomarkers also have some importance in the heart failure. Their importance lies in the SIS uh, in uh, establishing the prognosis in the case of heart failure. Now, uh, this is the B type natural uretic peptide and N terminal pro BNP. This is BNP and anti pro BNP. This is the measurement help in establishing the severity of the heart failure. Okay, so this is uh, that the natriuretic peptide level increases with age and the renal impairment. This is also important should be taken into account and are more elevated in women than in men. And, uh, and the, their quantity can be falsely low in the obese patients. Now, other the newer markers uh, that are available are the soluble ST2 and the delectin 3 are the newer biomarkers available nowadays. So, uh, in the biomarker BNP and the anti pro BNP is important. And their measurement help in assessing the severity of the heart failure, which and what the prognosis will be of the heart failure. Now, exercise testing. Exercise testing is also for the uh, prognosis, uh, to know the prognosis, the peak oxygen uptake of less than 14 ml per kg per minute is associated with the poor prognosis. So this was all about the uh, diagnosis of the heart failure. Now next we will go with the treatment of the heart failure, the management of heart failure. So we come to our next topic in the heart failure, it is the management of the heart failure. Uh, we will uh, discuss the management under the uh, under the management of the four different type of heart failures. First is the heart failure with uh, uh, the first is a chronic heart failure where reduced is action fraction. Second is the chronic heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and third is the acute decompensated heart failure that is very important and fourth is the advanced heart failure now first we will start with the management of the acute decompensated heart failure first you must know what is acute decompensated heart failure acute decompensated heart failure it results from the interrelated abnormality of the decreased cardiac performance renal function and alternation in the vascular compliance so this is 
what the definition of acute decompensated heart failure actually it is a heterogeneous clinical syndrome that results from dysfunction of interrelated dysfunction of all these things now what's the worst outcome in the acute decompensated heart failure that the outcome is not good if the blood urea nitrogen is greater than uh, 43 mg per dl and systolic blood pressure is less than 150 mm of hg and third is if serum creatinine is more than 2.75 mg per dl Now we come to the management of acute decompensated heart failure. First, uh, we must know the, what is the goal of the management in the acute decompensated heart failure. First is we have to stabilize the hemodynamic. If patient is having low BPA or whatsoever the vascular hemodynamic is, we have to stabilize it. Second, we have to identify the cause of decompensated in, uh, decompensation in this uh, heart failure and we have to treat it. It can be anything. It can be the renal uh, decompensation. It can be uh, due to some sepsis or it can be due to some pulmonary infection or whatsoever. You have to search for the cause of decompensation and have to treat it. Third, we have to re-establish the outpatient treatment that when we will discharge the patient, we have to uh, prescribe certain medication. Uh, for the heart failure and that we have to re-establish it. Second is the profile of the patient in acute decompensated stage and it is important acute in the acute decompensated stage the profile of the patient can be A, B, C and D. In the A uh, first it is uh, the, there are two determinant of the profile first is the left ventricular feeling pressure and third is the uh, cardi uh, second is the cardiac output. Now left ventricular filling pressure uh, it is LVFP and cardiac outward CO. Based on this, there are four types of patients that you will uh, see in an acute decompensated heart failure. In it, uh, uh, first profile A, it is when the cardiac output is normal and LV filling pressure is also normal. It is the warm and the dry stage. Stage B is the warm and the wet. Their cardiac output is normal, but there is increase in the left ventricular filling pressure that causes an uh, increase in the edema or uh, in increase in the hydrostatic pressure uh, and that uh, causes the increased left ventricular filling pressure and uh, due to which there is increased hydrostatic pressure edema. So that condition is the warm and the wet. Okay, and C profile is the cold and dry. There is a cold means that the decreased cardiac output. So uh, the uh, limbs are um, cold and because of the decreased car cardiac output. So this is cold and dry. Dry why? Because LVFP is normal. And stage uh, profile D in an uh, ADHF is uh, cold and the wet. Cold means cardiac output is decreased and wet means the wet means there is increased LVFP. Now, uh, why this is important? Because uh, the different uh, profile patient has uh, different treatment options. If patient is having uh, is under profile A, then you must search for other pulmonary and hepatic uh, disease or any transient myocardial ischemia. Okay, if a uh, patient is uh, under profile B, then it is an acute pulmonary edema. Treatment is diuretic and vasodilator that we will uh, deal in um, large in the next coming videos. And third is the profile uh, C. Profile in if the patient uh, is under the profile C, that is cold and dry, uh, you have to uh, first do the Although the heart catheterization is not uh, performed, it's not indicated until patient is not responding to the routine therapy. So uh, it is only when the patient is not uh, responding to the routine therapies of diuresis or vasodilator or any fluid challenge, then only this uh, heart, right uh, heart catheterization is done. Now. If the profile C, it is the patient's under profile C, cold and dry, uh, 
and you uh, you have to do the right heart catheterization if the lvfp pressure is low then cautious uh, trial of the fluid replenishing can be done rest therapy uh, will depend on the clinical situation and patient your uh, input output status patient bp and patient uh, edema or any what whatsoever if the patient volume status uh, the rest treatment will depend on this now profile d is that there is cold and wet state in which there is decreased cardiac output and increased lv filling pressure that is the wet condition also so you have to give the inotropes with the vasodilator effects so this is the treatment of profile d in the coming videos we will discuss this thing in detail that which drug should be used and what are the available drugs and other available options that we also have in the heart failure so uh, this is the basic lineup of the management and acute decompensated heart failure next we will discuss the drugs and all other topics uh, of the heart failure management also we come to our next topic in the acute decompensated heart failure that's the first is the iv therapy that we use in the acute decompensated heart failure first come the diuretic in diuretic we have the furosemide it is given this is a loop diuretic and it is the most commonly uh, is a most commonly used uh, loop diuretic in the ATHF and the dose is 20 to 250 mg per day intravenous other are tocilizumide and bumetanide their dosing is uh, 10 to 100 uh, mg for the tocilizumide and bumetanide is 0.5 to 5 mg per day now other comes the vasodilator i have explained you the different uh, profile of the patient maybe at for which uh, you have the different uh, therapies that is diuretic vasodilator anatropic depending upon the profile of the patient so uh, in the vasodilator we have the nitroglycerin uh, which is initiated at a dose of 20 to 10 to 20 mg per minute to it can be increased to 200 mg per minute now other is a nesetiride it is an recombinant uh, grain nitroglycerin type peptide its bolus is 2 mg per kg and it is followed by an infusion of 0.01 mg per kg per minute now other one is the nitroprusside nitroprusside is given as in it is given from 0.3 mg per kg per minute to 5 mg per kg per minute now other one is the serelaxin it is in the trial and it is a recombinant human relaxin 2 and uh, its secretion is up regulated in the pregnancy and uh, studies have found it out that uh, this uh, serelaxin has uh, improved the dyspnea improved the contactile property of the heart and uh, so basically it uh, it improves the dyspnea and decreases congestion in the in the lungs uh, so but it is in the trial so right now it is not in use other comes the anotropic therapy in the anotropic therapy i have explained you previously also uh, in the that we we have to use the anotrop with the vasodilator therapy with the with the vasodilatation activity also so uh, first come under it is a dubutamine its dosing is i will explain you later the, the which in which receptor they will act and what is their mechanism of action first we will go into only uh, the classification and uh, the of the drugs in the adhf and their dosing now first is a dubutamine it is uh, given into in uh, a dose of 2 to 20 mg per kg per minute and uh, second is the milrinone and it is given uh, in the 0.375 to 0.75 mg per kg per minute dose c is the levosimandine and it is given in the dose of 0.1 mg per kg per minute other one is the uh, omi camtev micarbel it is in trials and it is a 
selective myosin activator okay so now next uh, we will go into the different type of management uh, if we put all the things uh, together and what we will have in an ADHF what you have to manage first we you have to manage the volume second you have to uh, manage any vascular uh, vascular uh, management that we have under vascular therapy and uh, so let's start with the volume management volume management first is the IV diuretic IV diuretic uh, that I have explained you uh, in the um, previously that there is fusamide or uh, another uh, loop diuretic that you are use that we use but uh, one more thing that is important here that the addition of uh, metolazone uh, provides a synergistic effect and this is important in the addition of the metolazone and diuresis uh, should be continued until the euvolumia has been achieved second that i like to tell you in the volume management is a cardiorenal syndrome it is a complication of adhf there are different type of cardiorenal syndrome different type of cardiorenal syndrome we will not go into detail of it but it is due to the interplay between the abnormality of heart and the kidney function that due to the abnormality of the um, heart there is abnormality in the renal function and due to the abnormality of renal function there is abnormality of the heart so this is a cardiorenal syndrome and reflects the interplay between the abnormality of heart and the kidney third comes uh, is the ultra filtration in the volume management this is an invasive fluid removal technique and most advantage of it is there is control rate of fluid removal and there is neutral effect on the serum electrolyte and there is decreased neurohormonal activity after the ultrafiltration. but uh, the studies have also this is a very good technique as far as uh, uh, this these benefit are concerned but the studies have shown that there is no benefit in the mortality or other things when compared to the diuresis so this uh, it's it's you should be depending upon depends on the clinical uh, situation and the uh, harm and the benefit uh, ratio now last uh, here we will have the vascular therapy in the vascular therapy as i have told you in the adhf in the vascular management you have the vasodilator and the anotropes Vasodilators are IV nitride, nitroprosite, and nisetiride, and uh, that is a recombinant BNP, and the serelaxin that is a recombinant human relaxin 2, and it is upregulated in pregnancy. It is also in trials. Uh, so these are the vasodilators that you, we have discussed the dosing previously, and. Uh, and other one is the anotropic therapy that we will use in the, that we will explain in the coming uh, session so we come to our next part in the vascular therapy in the management of the acute decompensated heart failure we come to the anotropic therapy anotropic therapy it includes the agent that indirectly or directly increases the intracellular concentration of the cyclic EMP and that causes the contraction uh, I have explained you earlier the doses now I will explain their mechanism of action dobutamine it stimulates the beta 1 and beta 2 receptors with little effect on the alpha 1 receptor means uh, due to the beta 2 agonist activity it is also having some vasodilator property also now second comes the milrinone milrinone is an uh, phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitor it is a slow acting and renally excreted agent so it requires an adjustment in patient whose KFT is deranged because it is excreted renally now next comes the levosimandis 
it is a calcium sensitizer that provides inotropic support also it has some phosphodiesterase free inhibition that uh, are vasodilatory that causes a vasodilatory property in it also then comes the and uh, selective myosin activator that is the omi cantil micarbyl this uh, this is in trial right now and it prolongs the ejection period and increases the fractional shortening uh, and then come as the neuro hormonal antagonist this is a different therapy as we know that in the acute decompensated state neuro hormonal antagonist uh, doesn't work to that much that uh, it works in the chronic heart failure so it is not uh, advisable to start the neuro uh, hormonal antagonist but and selective but and selective a1 adenosine receptor antagonist called dulopilin it is in trials right now also studies uh, that has uh, been on it is not supportive of any benefit but still it is in the trial so we must know about it also a neuro hormonal antagonist known as the dulopilin in trials right now one more thing that need mention is a different type of uh, acute decompensated heart failure type in the 19th edition of the harrison they have removed the profile different profile of the patient that i have discussed in the previous videos in the starting videos Uh, that there are four type of profile that we have discussed a b c d a b have the normal cardiac output c d has the decreased cardiac output and uh, and b and d has the elevated uh, left ventricular filling pressure uh, but in the new 19th edition they have removed uh, the profile uh, a b c d and they have uh, discussed the four different type of uh, ATHF uh, syndromes. The first that comes under is the acute decompensated uh, heart failure. That is typical, and it can be in the hypertensive, can be normal hypertensive. The high risk factor for it is the renal disease, acute coronary syndrome, arrhythmias, hypoxia, pulmonary embolism, infection. So. In which, uh, in it, uh, if uh, the patient is normal tensor, usually uh, they are volume overloaded. So in it, you have to use the diuretic. If patient is hypertensive, usually these are not volume overloaded. There is no volume overload in such patient. You have to use the vasodilator. Vasodilator means IV nitrites. You have to use nitroglycerides and. <coughs> That's all we uh, that we have discussed earlier. These we have to use in this uh, hypertension. We have to use the vasodilator. Second, that comes uh, under this is the acute decompensated. That is pulmonary edema. There is severe pulmonary congestion with hypoxia. The risk factor for it is the new onset arrhythmia, valvular heart disease, inflammatory heart disease, myocardial ischemia, CNS injury, and the drug toxicity. Now, what we have to give in it is the oxygen and the non-invasive ventilation, and other is the diuretic that we have to give. Other is the OPA that uh, causes the increased absorption of the fluid from the lung, and also it decreases the pain. And uh, vasodilators that we have to give in it. Now. third that comes is the acute decompensation due to the low cardiac output now uh, there is hypoperfusion with the end organ dysfunction in it and what are the risk factors there is the low pulse pressure cool extremities cardiorenal syndrome and hepatic congestion that are the risk factors for this type of acute heart failure to develop in it what you have to give is the anotropic therapy if low bp or diuretic is refractory uh, then you have to give the anotropic therapy 
other is the vasodilators that you have to give and in the last that comes is the acute decompensation that is due to the cardiogenic shock that we call the cardiogenic shock in it there is hypotension, low cardiac output and there is end organ damage what are the risk factors? there is, there is esteem desistance, there is pulmonary congestion and there is renal failure now uh, what to give in it is the anotropic therapy usually catecholamine generally may have used the vasodilators the anotrops with vasodilating the action in the acute decompensated heart failure as I explained previously but here in the cardiogenic shock you have to use usually catecholamine such as the anotrops catecholamine means you have to use the norad as the anotrop or dopamine as the anotrop usually dobutamine should be uh, restricted the use is restricted in it because it has vasodilating action also Dermitamine. So uh, here we have to use only anatropic support because this is cardiogenic shock. Now other that you can go with is the mechanical support. The mechanical support is with the intraortic balloon pulsation, ventricular assisted devices, and this is ultrafiltration. I have explained here this ultrafiltration technique. If this is an invasive fluid removal technique. Uh, I have explained in the previous video what is the intraortic balloon pulsation. This is uh, to maintain the to maintain the heart uh, during uh, during the cardiogenic shock and also as a bridge therapy for any transplantation or uh, any ventricular assisted device. Uh, so these therapy act as a bridge, especially the VAD for the transplantation and IABP for the uh, ventricular assisted device so these are the best therapy to maintain uh, the heart until uh, there is some ability of the transplantation or there is any uh, to buy time uh, for the implantation of the ventricular assisted devices so this is important other is the ultra filtration that I have explained this is all about the acute decompensated heart failure next we will go with the chronic heart failure and their treatment so uh, we are starting with the second part of the this heart failure management topic it is the chronic heart failure with the reduced ejection fraction now uh, in this first uh, what we have to do first point that comes is the neurohormonal antagonist that we have already uh, taken in the pathophysiology of the heart failure the neurohormonal activation has a very vital role in the etiology of any heart failure so its antagonism is very important initially clinical strategy is to start with the two drug combination that can be ACE inhibitor and beta blocker because these two drugs have shown a long term survival in a patient with heart failure so but if the beta blocker is intolerant then you can uh, have a combination of ACE inhibitor and the ARP and if ACE inhibitor is intolerant then you can have a combination of ARP and the beta blocker other drugs that comes in it is the alaskarin it is a direct renin inhibitor but it's used uh, has uh, is not been too famous or it is not used commonly because of the side effects it has the hyperkalemia and the effect on the renal function due to this its uh, use has been withdrawn now other that comes is the mineralocorticoid antagonist there are two type of mineralocorticoid antagonist first one is the selective that is the aptorenon and it is non-selective that is spironolactone both has shown reduction mortality in all stages of NYHA from second class to the fourth class it has shown the reduction mortality in the chronic heart failure and now the other drugs that comes uh, is arteriovenous vasodilators the patient, these are used only when the patient who can't tolerate the RAS based therapy and these are given in the fixed dose 
of isosorbide dinitrate with hydalazine and it is to be tried only when the patient is intolerant to the ras based therapy okay now third comes the heart rate modification heart rate modification drug use is the evabetrin it is also a second line therapy but it is to be used before the digoxin digoxin nowadays is not preferred because of its narrow therapeutic range so nowadays evabetrin has occupied the second line therapy place which was previously was for the digoxin what is evabradrin evabradrin is an inhibitor of the if current in the sno that slows the heart rate without any anotropic negative anotropic effect so evabradrin is used as a second line therapy before the digoxin in patient who are symptomatic even on the ace inhibitor arb beta blocker and benzylocorticoid antagonist and with the restful heart rate greater than 70 beats per minute means the patient who are symptomatic even on the ras based therapy and their residual heart rate is greater than 70 then in those patient there is indication for the uh, for starting the evabrad now comes the digoxin d digoxin is uh, once was a very famous drug in the heart failure but nowadays its use has been withdrawn because of its narrow therapeutic range and the point is it exert a mild anotropic effect attenuate the carotid sinus baroreceptor activity and is sympathetic or inhibitor okay it is now used only when the patient is severely symptomatic despite the optimum neurohormonal blockade and adequate volume control okay it is to be used only when the patient is symptomatic despite the optimal neurohormonal blockade and adequate volume control now e is the oral diuretic oral diuretic is to be used there is no long term benefit in the oral long term diuretic so it is to be used just to control the symptom these drugs that we have discussed has a role in the long term mortality in the patient with heart failure but this drug is not having any such benefit any such long term benefit so its use should be based only on the present condition of the patient so its aim is to achieve the volume control before the neurohormonal therapy is well titrated okay now fifth is the novel neurohormonal antagonist okay these are the newer drugs that's why it is novel neurohormonal antagonist uh commonly used neural uh, neurohormonal antagonists are the ace inhibitor beta blocker arbs menylocorticoid antagonists but these are the newer ones as uh, previously thought that the endothelin anta- antagonist that is cosentin which is uh, commonly used in the pulmonary arterial hypertension and uh, centrally acting sympathetolytic agents as the moxotenity these two drugs uh, was having a worse outcome in the heart failure in conducted studies so these uh, two trials uh, were definitely wrong in this uh, in, the, in the under the heading novel uh, neurohormonal antagonist they have uh, these drugs have proven wrong in the treatment of uh, the heart failure now one drug that is still coming and it is uh, giving some uh, positive uh, indications is the oma pentrelate oma pentrelate actually habit as is ace inhibitor with an endopeptidase inhibitor that is lcj696 this combination has shown benefit in comparison to the therapy that has ace inhibitor alone so this is giving some promising uh, results in the studies but also still it is in the trials and has not come in the use 
Now, last is the antiplatelet and anticoagulation. Antiplatelet therapy, aspirin, only to be used in patients with ischemic heart disease. Uh, otherwise, its use in the chronic heart failure is not indicated. Dose is 75 to 81 mg per day. Warfarin, if warfarin is uh, considered, there is anticoagulant. It is to be considered only if there is chronic atrial fibrillation and if there is paroxysmal atrial fibrillation or if there is any ischemic or systemic or pulmonary embolism. Okay. Uh, we are still having some therapies or some points regarding the chronic heart failure to reduce EF that we will discuss uh, in coming session. So, in continuation with the previous session, this is the chronic heart failure with the reduced EF. We come to the statin now. In the treatment part, statin use is not indicated until unless uh, the etiology behind the heart failure is ischemic heart disease. So it is its use in the non-ischemic heart failure is not advised. Now we come to the fish oil. Fish oil is uh, rich in the long term omega-3 uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid. So omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acid increases the uh, two acids that are associated with the decreased mortality in patient of heart failure. Their increased blood level is associated with the decreased mortality and good prognosis in the patient of heart failure. These are the eicosapentoic acid and the docoxahentoic acid. So omega-3 uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid increases the circulatory level of these two acids. Now we come to the micronutrients. It is seen that the thymine and the selenium has been associated with some cardiomyopathies and that are associated with uh, heart failure. So their deficiency is uh, associated with heart failure in some cases. So their uh, deficiency should not be there. So uh, macronutrient thymine and selenium should be replenished in patients with heart failure. Now, now we come to a very important part that is the uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy. In the cardiac resynchronization therapy, uh, where it is, it is to be used, first of all you must know what it is. The non-synchronized contraction between the wall of left ventricle, that is the intraventricular, or between the ventricular chambers, that is interventricular, that is between right and left there is non-synchronous contraction. So that impairs the systolic function of the heart and adversely affect the ventricular filling. So this need to be tracked in, in uh, such cases of heart failure in which there is non-synchronization. So uh, it, is to, it is treated uh, with uh, CRT therapy. CRT is a type of biventricular pacemaker you can say. So, in which it causes the, the contraction of both the ventricles synchronously and that's why uh, this defect is removed by CRD. Indication is symptomatic uh, heart failure patient with reduced EF with QRS duration greater than 149 milliseconds and a left bundle branch block in the EC. Okay, so this is an uh, important thing. Now we come to our next important thing in the heart failure. This is the implantable cardioverter defibrillator. That we call the ICD. Indication of this is that patient with NYHA class second or third of heart failure and and ejection fraction less than 35 percent. They should be given an ICD. This is to prevent a sudden episode of VFAP then this defibrillator will uh, discharge the impulses that will cause the weak fat to revert to the normal rate. So this should be, this is uh, to prevent the sudden cardiac death in patients of heart failure. So this is the indication uh, if it is uh, as far as the heart failure is concerned. In the post MI patient, uh, it is to be given only when 40 days after the MI. EF is less than 35 or 30 to 35 percent, 
then only end patient is symptomatic and then only this ICD has to be given in case of the MI. Less than 40 days uh, MI uh, uh, is uh, not to be treated with the ICD. Now, some genetic based study, this is a cellular and gene based therapy. It, it is seen that the, uh, the cell of the heart is not only, uh, they, they are not only a normal uh, cell, they have a capacity of regeneration. So this uh, has to be exploited in the gene based therapy. So also it is in the trial, but uh, the autologous secret positive cells that are uh, collected from the atria uh, of, of a person having the CABD then uh, uh, it is has to be delivered uh, via uh, the methods of delivery is the direct uh, intramyocardial injection or uh, coronary artery or venous infusion or injection into the pericardial space. So these are the cellular and the gene based therapy. Now we come to the uh, chronic heart failure with preserved EF. Now it is uh, you have to first find out the cause of the CHF and then treat the underlying cause. Now, uh, second, you have to go this, I have explained you earlier, this is OMA Pantylate. It is an, uh, it is a special compound that hybridizes the AS inhibitor with the special endopeptidase inhibitor that is LCZ696 and that uh, has a good neurohormonal antagonist in comparison to the ACE inhibitor alone. So this has a role in the CHF preserved period. Second, one more thing is very important is the exercise intolerance in a case of uh, heart failure with preserved EF is a manifestation of the chronotopic, chronotopic insufficiency. So that uh, pacemaker can be used to correct it. Now at last I have uh, flow chart uh, or treatment plan in a case of CHF will reduce EF. So this is a very important because most of the CHF patients are with reduced EF. So we must know what to give as an outpatient, outpatient uh, prescription what we have to give. So first to start with is the ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker. If ACE, if beta blocker is intolerant then you can add an ARP instead of beta blocker and if ACE inhibitor is intolerant you can add an ARB instead of beta blocker so it uh, instead of ACE I uh, instead of ACE inhibitor you can have ARB if ACE I is intolerant and if beta blocker is intolerant you add an ARB uh, to the ACE inhibitor so we get a three combination of it so this is the dual therapy two drug therapy we have to start with this is the first one and then you have to titrate it every two weeks to the maximum tolerated dose in trials as in trials as in trials so what is the maximum tolerated dose you have to reach that this is the first point and second is that you must have an add-on effect with the mineralocorticoid antibodies that is the aprilon or at the spirino lactone okay now third that is very important if still patient is not responding to the drug based therapy then you must add a fixed dose combination of iso, sodbite, nitrate and hydrazine if patient is intolerant to the RAS based therapy. So and the fourth point is is the EVA Bradden. EVA Bradden is to be added if patient is still symptomatic. And Eva Bradrin is uh, to be added is a second line uh, second line therapy in the chronic heart failure with uh, preserved EF, and it is to be used before the digoxin. Okay, so uh, this is Eva Bradrin. Uh, we have to add at the fourth point. Digoxin, if uh, still patient is severely symptomatic, even after the RAS based therapy and after using the EVA Bradden, then you have to add the tandoxin because it has a very narrow uh, clinical, narrow therapeutic profile so it is to be added only if patient is severely symptomatic despite all the medical therapy given. 
Now, at last is the use of diuretic. Use of diuretic is based on the symptom. Okay, if patient is having the symptom of fluid overload, you have to add it. Well, any symptom of congestion if patient is having, you have to add it. Otherwise, there is no long term benefit with the diuretic loaded. So, its use should be restricted only as per the symptom. Okay, so this was all about the chronic heart failure will reduce here. Now in the next session we will have some uh, some detailed uh, explanation of the drugs that we have discussed previously. So let's come to the drugs part. First uh, drug that is used is a diuretic. Diuretic can be uh, loop diuretic. Loop diuretic are the maximum potency diuretic. Uh, they act on the sodium, potassium, and two chloride channel in the uh, ascending thick limb of loop of family. Uh, this is tosamide is 20 to 40 mg. Uh, Tosamide dose is 10 to 20. Rotamide is 0.5 to 1 mg. Hyzoid is a hydrochlorothiazone and metorazone. Metorazone, I have uh, told you earlier, it has a synergistic effect when added to the loop diuretic. It inhibits the sodium potassium uh, absorption in the distal converted region. Now, other is a potassium aspirate. This is spironolactone and epilirenone. It acts on, a, on collecting ducts. These are potassium aspirate. And this is aldosterone antagonist user. Now, side effects uh, of the uh, diuretic broadly are electrolyte uh, disturbances, volume depletion, azotemia, arrhythmia due to the potassium imbalance. Okay. So, other one uh, that we come, other drug is the ACE inhibitor. ACE inhibitor, uh, captopril, inalapril. Captopril doses is starting at 6.25 mbt here to 50 mbtds, in other pill is 2.5 uh, mcpd to 10 to 20 mbpd. Uh, side effect is hypotension, mild potassium retention, non-productive cuff, angioedema. This is contraindicated uh, in the patient with single kidney and with bilateral renal artery stenosis. Now third uh, group is the angiotensin receptor blockers. This is Cantisartin, uh, started at 4 to 8 mg per day to 32 mg per day. Valsartin is started as 40 mg twice a day to 160 mg twice a day. Side effects are uh, hypertension, azotemia and the hypercalemia. Non-productive cup that is there in the ACE inhibitor, not there in the ACE Beta blocker, only cardioselective beta blockers is effective in the and increasing the survival and prognosis in the heart failure, only cardioselective beta blocker are effective. So, uh, this is carbidolol starting at uh, 3.125 uh, mg BID to 25 to 50 mg BID. Metoprolol at 1.5 to 25 mg per day to 200 mg per day. Bisoprolol at 1.25 mg per day to 10 mg per day. And the side effect it causes the bradycardia, heart block, bronchus pass also it is uncommon in the cardioselective beta blocker. And other is a pubertas. Now comes the fixed uh, dose of hydralizine and the isosorbide dynamically. It comes in combination of 37.5 to 20 mg uh, QIV to 75 to 40 mg QIV. Now other is the... Uh, Levosimantin uh, that increases the sensitization of the dropsy to the calcium, causing the increased effect of the calcium and increasing contactability. Now, milrinone is the foxodiesterase third inhibitor and it increases the cyclic AMP concentration and that causes the increased contactability. So, it was uh, all about the rough idea of the drugs that are useful in the heart failure and uh, the things how the flowchart should go on for a patient of heart failure that is more important for us 
than knowing all, all this uh, that I have explained you previously, mm-hmm. the flow in which you must start and prescribe a drug in a patient of heart failure. 